we will see so many authors, so many strange authors, <laughs> you will see, and so, so many very famous authors. First one is Ronald Dawkins, this uh, kind of successor of heart in some ways and in some other ways is quite different. We will see all these kind of things. Then we will see the American realism. So many realists that there are realists that we will see in which way they think that could be realist and the Scandinavian realism also. Then we will talk a little more about utilitarianism. For sure you have heard something about utilitarianism and we talked about this in one of the lectures of the last weeks. And finally, we will see especially John Rawls and his theory that is so famous and then something about Robert Nasik. So, with this, we can begin with Ronald Dorkin. For sure you have heard something about Ronald Dorkin. Yep. Uh, Okay. Yeah, for sure you have heard something about him. Um, is don't you know where it is? This photo where what was taken took. Well, it is in Oxford. You think it's in Oxford? Here you can see well one of the famous buildings of the one of the college of Oxford and all well, the college university. And why put this photo or speak about Ronald Dorkin? This is one of the famous photos. Probably all people used to remember Dorkin in this fashion. <laughs> yeah. It's because we have to understand more or less his life to understand his thought. And that's uh, why I, I showed you that photo, because in the very beginning of his career, he was a professor of jurisprudence, as I <laughs> uh, now. You know? But he was uh, the successor of a great professor called Everett Hart. For sure, you re remember so many things about Everhart. Oh. And in some ways, he is an successor and he developed his mind, his ideas. We cannot understand Dorkin without heart. It, it is very, very interesting, this, no? So many people say, no, it's the contrary of heart. And it is not. Probably uh, he needs heart to develop his, his, his thought. In any case, after that, he was also professor in, in Yale, Yale uh, University, and, in, and then he moved to the United States. Uh, well, uh, um, he used to teach in New York University. Well, so there are many things that we can talk about uh, Ronald Dorkin. Many things. He have uh, many topics. Uh, many interesting ideas, but I think that the best way to understand the principal ideas of his mind is to begin to uh, trying to divide uh, the hard cases and the easy cases. For sure, you have heard about something about that, no? Uh, but uh, we can say. Uh, that Durkin realized that there could be some easy cases that nobody will question uh, because well, if it's so clear that, if, for example, if you uh, are driving and you pass a light, a red light, you will have a fine and there is a law and you have to fulfill 
uh, well, so many things, and you, you will be punished with a fine because, well, it's reasonable that the, that uh, there should be some guidelines for the traffic, um, some sanctions to the people that uh, trespass this kind of uh, laws. So, but in, in, in there are some problems because there are some hard cases that you cannot resolve with the rules of law, with the set of rules of law that is approved in one country. There is a, well, a huge amount of laws in each country. And yeah, so, okay. So, in this way, he, he thinks that, that, well, how can a judge resolve these kind of cases without a, a precise provision to do that? Remember, you can remember the movement of the codification, no? the great idea behind that movement is all kind of law had to be in a code in a code and at the very beginning they said no if there is uh, if there something is not in the code well it is not law and you can do anything that you want so the law must be in the code but it is it is a naive approach to the law yeah but very soon all, all people realize that all things cannot be in a code it's so difficult and you have to uh, use some other kind of tools to resolve cases especially especially the judge if you put a, a case an easy or a hard case to a, a law and to a judge to decide it so the judge always have to decide that case and uh, and the law probably will be not so uh, uh, will have not all the tools we have not the integrity the integrity this is the walls that uh, especially had a uh, uh, dorking use to resolve that so in which way we can resolve that well this is the hard question no? so he's then said, uh, made a critique to Hart, saying well you're using well, the semantic approach well you are part of the semantic theories of the law you are a positivist that only use the rules of law no? well um, uh, the, the critique is the project of digging out shared rules from a careful study of what lawyers say and do. Well, so you try to resolve all things well only in in, in seeing what the rules says and what the lawyer says about the rules. No? So, so he then. Uh, Say no, it is not enough. It is not enough. The concept of validity, for sure, you will remember heart, the things that we said about heart. Uh, and and it, for sure, you will remember the, that she thinks about that there should be two kind of rules the primary rules and the secondary rules and the, in the secondary rules, three kind of rules and the most important of his system of law is the rule of recognition, the recognition that the society and the authorities also made to the things that you, we can call law. No? And if there is some recognition, some political recognition this is the most interesting word some the, the the law will be valid 
and if not, if there is not any kind of recognition from the society, a political recognition, probably it will be not bad. So, our author now, Ronald Dorkin, said that the rule of the country recognition is just a test of, of pedigree, a pedigree thesis. No? So, uh, because, uh, and you can see also that in so many cases, uh, you will be discovered that the judge will never apply this pedigree test. When do you think that a judge say, well, it is not valid this, this law in this case because the, the society never uh, recognize this? Well, <laughs> never, <laughs> never, <laughs> no, so, it says we have to take care about other kind of tools and not uh, that of the semantic theory of the law. Obviously, Hart never accept uh, the, the ideas that Dorkin said. No? He said, no, I'm not in the semantic theory. I'm in the theory of interpretation. We will see a little more just now. <laughs> about this new approach to the law, no. So, how Dorkin manage the, that hard cases, no? How th he thinks that it could work uh, to, de to define the law in these cases? Well, <laughs> he said, well, cases ought to be decided not with the account of the political organization of a legal system, not in this. And uh, as, I, uh, as I just told uh, to you, no? there is a, not a, 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 a duty of the judge to try to realize what kind of political organization approval could, could be. Uh, there is no rule of recognition. What the judge have to do? Well, he have to interpret, interpret uh, the, the law, the law, not uh, not just one rule of law, but hold the legal system in order to to uh, resolve the case. So. In some sense, in some sense, the law is like literature. Why like uh, literature? Because if you open, for example, a great novel, a great story, a great, I don't know, tale, <laughs> you, when you are reading that story, novel, tale, you will try to understand what the author says about that that story, no? His meaning, his thought, his well, the things that he brought. That is more or less the approach of Dorkin when he talked about the law as literature. No? So we will try to interpret the, the concepts that are behind of that letters. So it means it means not just to read a constructive interpretation of the institutional history of the legal system. Constructive interpretation. For me it is very clever. Uh, he's very clever because in this part, in this part especially because it fits very well with the traditional, the classical theory of the knowledge. The Aristotelian one that say, well, and the Aquinas one that say, well, when we think about things, our knowledge is, there are two parts of the knowledge, the active knowledge and the Passive knowledge. The passive knowledge only receives forms. We receive by the arise, the, the forms of the lake, of the birds, 
and we can hear some of the things that are around us. But there is not just reception. There is just there is another thing, a light, the active or agent intellect that puts a light on these things, and we then discover so many things. So the the, the knowledge could be built. There, when we read a, a, a book, a tale, we put our minds, and that's why two readings uh, never will be the same. You can ask to some of your friends, well, what do you think about this book? The same book that you read and he read, uh, probably there will be two interpretations. There will be two interpretations. So we will develop a little more these ideas in the next lectures, but now I want to stress out that uh, word, the constructive interpretation of a book, of a tale, or of the legal system. However, however, he never, I think, uh, developed so much this, this word, the constructive inter interpretation. He could develop better, but uh, he he then uh, passed to use another scheme. He said that in the legal system we can find three things: not just the rules, the set of rules, the positive norms, uh, but also principles and policies. And with this set of tools, we can resolve, especially the judge and we solve all kinds of cases. So we need not just rules, but the legal system have also principles and policies. And what is principles and policies? Well, there, there are two kinds of the standards. This is the, the very interesting idea. Two kinds of the standards uh, that would uh, help us to decide hard cases, no? Well, the, the, the standards that ought to be observed, to be observed, to be observed, in some sense, uh, have to deal with morality, this kind of standards, the principles, and standards that sets out a goal to be reached. And for example, about policies. Uh, well, for sure you have heard something about coronavirus and the measures that any country are trying to apply uh, to resolve that kind of things. One of that measures is to buy, to, to make some agreements, to sign some agreement with the big pharmacy companies like AstraZeneca, uh, Novavax, Moderna, and so on. So uh, many states now are buying and pre-ordering so many million of doses of vaccine. Uh, they have probably 2,000 possibilities of, comp of companies. More or less, one study I have heard that probably could be one hundred and a half, and another two hundred of companies developing vaccines to resolve or big problem of coronavirus pre-ordering. You know? But any government can choose. No, I will. You, I will make a deal with AstraZeneca because it's the cheapest vaccine probably the best one and and others say no it's more proven the moderna machine or the, that that nova vax vaccine uh, so they can choose uh, in order to find a goal no? you have it's not a principle of law it's just a policy that is the notion of policy so 
he said. With these three things, judge can resolve any case, any case, any case in, 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 in that we can put to them. Uh, with rules, we cannot decide. So that's why, that's why uh, the legal system has integrity. Remember that word again, integrity. Because we have all the tools to resolve easy and hard cases. So uh, you, uh, you, you don't need anything else. It is a very interesting thing that he said that principles have to, to be deals with morality. And that's why every interpretation of the law, of the rules, needs to uh, a moral consideration, a moral analysis, a moral argument, and, and especially we can find the, a book of Ronald Dorkin about the moral analysis of the US Constitution. It's incredible, a moral analysis, no? And it's a book of law, according to his understanding. So let's go again to this, no? What means the integrity of the legal system? And then you will be surprised with this, no? That just will be, that will be one right answer thesis. Well, there is just one right answer in any case, in easy cases and in hard cases. The judge can decide, decide just one thing, one thing. And, and it is very complicated because well, there is a lot of things, of elements that any judge have to consider. For sure you will remember one hero of the antiquity, of the mythology, of the or of antiquities of Greece and then also something similar in, in Rome, Hercules. Hercules. He said, well, in probably the, our judge have to be like that uh, guy with a lot of powers, of skills, of knowledge, a uh, demigod, <laughs> a demigod to resolve all our cases because he have to take care of all kind of possibilities of elements that could be in the legal system. So, uh, just that that judge will resolve all of them, and even he can fail because he can <laughs> even he can fail. It's interesting, no? So it, it is a consequence. I don't know if you realize it is a consequence of the characteristic. Of the, of the integrity of the legal system. Well, I don't know what do you think about Dorkin. I ask you now. If you think that the legal system have integrity, um, well, what kind of if it all all legal analysis of the cases should have um, moral argumentation and if there is just one answer what do you think about this here's very provocative uh, ronald dorkin i don't know if some of one of you want to ex think about make a comment or a question or a question also. Yes, that's me. Okay, so my contribution would be, first of all, I, I agree with the whole, um, so I analyze that what Jorkin said is that cases should be decided independent of the, of the state and the political system. Um, 
or the the politics arising within a particular time. So I agree with that because I think it fits in with separation of powers. I'm not sure if I've misunderstood, so just correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But that's what I understood from what he said. Oh. Yeah. Additionally, um, I understood that. Um, sorry. So additionally, I understood that the judges should be all knowing of sorts because they're dealing with such cases. They should have the right answer for them and they should use rules, principles and policies to do so, which would then give integrity to the system. So, so you agree that there should be just one answer? Um, no, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't know if I understood exactly what the one answer um, thesis was about, but I don't think that there's ever one answer. So if the judges are expected to also just give one answer, then it already goes against, for example, the Court of Appeal, because in the Court of Appeal, you have three judges and each judge gives their own answer showing that there cannot be one answer. Yeah, but you agree problem. that if that, yeah. on the other hand, if there is a, a legal system that have integrity, you agree with that, that idea? Um, I believe that if judges interpret cases properly, then yes, but there the, can be integrity. About the integrity? I don't know if at the moment in all legal systems there is integrity because in all legal systems you will have faults and especially in African legal systems I think we've seen a perpetuated um, Some gaps. system of injustice yes yeah okay well Calvin don't you want to say something yes good morning Good morning. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, so yeah, I think I agree with him that a legal system should have integrity. But then again, if you look at it practically, as in how law is actually practiced in different juris jurisdictions, you might also see that uh, judges sometimes are per perpetuators of systematic injustice. And sometimes the legal system does not have integrity and it's, uh, it's biased. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, it means that from time to time, yes, from time to time, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it depends. I mean, I mean, different jurisdictions. Well, well, the, different the, the legal system have or not have is not two, two, two possibilities. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can say you can say that the bad uh, mm -hmm. judge uh, probably are against the legal system. All right. And uh, I think that is what do what you mean? I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I wanted to comment something on his interpretive approach. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good idea to have, you know, to interpret something so that uh, you may um, get into an outcome that is justiciable and also conforms to, you know, national values and such. Um, just like the Constitution of Kenya says that the Constitution must be interpreted in such a way that it may uphold its values. However, I think that interpretation falls short when there are specific instances where interpre interpretation is not to be used. For example, taxation law. You cannot interpret taxation law, but you just must read it as it is. So yeah, I would say uh, he falls short there because not all laws are to be interpreted. They're just to be read as is. You should be, you should read some kind of law just as it is, no? Yeah. Yeah. There's some kind of law should. that should just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should not be read between the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would just be... Um, I remember just, a judge mm. from Argentina that says that he never had any easy case. <laughs> <laughs> because if the easiest case, in the easiest one, Mm. For example, you have to pay a tax, no? Yeah. Well, there are two parties, and the other party say, "No, I have not to pay that." <laughs> and mm -hmm. why? And they put a lot of arguments. So the, an easy case, an easy case, have a lot of interpretations. 
Yeah. So, the, uh, what it means to read uh, the law as such? <laughs> what could be so many things? Hmm. Okay. Well, okay. Natalie, don't you want to say something? Something? Uh, good afternoon. Yes, I I wanted to ask. My understanding of him talking about the Hercu the judge Hercules is basically he has to, you know, he has to really um, apply law and think about it to come to to uh, actually um, solve hard cases. But yeah. and that to my mind means that you know he has some sort of discretion on what uh, principles exactly he's going to rely on and what not. But then in one of the critiques of Dawkins' um, um, uh, theory is that his uh, judges do have discretion. I don't, I can't, um, I don't find where he said that judges don't have discretion. So I'm a bit confused on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is too many, too many interpretations of the same phrase of, of Dorkin, and you will read author that it says, well, author put and gives some discretion, and works, I think, that say, no, author, he never <laughs> gives a lot of discretion. Uh, he talked about that there should be just one right answer. This is more or less, more or less the, the usual understanding of Dorkin. Uh, we can say, we can say that probably there could be so many answers. This is my, my position at least, no? One answer that should be right. One answer that should be right. But probably the uh, legal system allows you, allows you uh, to have more than one answer, and it is very clear, especially where there are so many possibilities not defined by the superior law. This is one thing that Kelsen talk about so much, well, that the superior law can uh, allow you so many possibilities, and you will choose one of them. Well, but this is not the thesis of, of Dorkin in the usual understanding of Dorkin. So one more, uh, Georgina, just because we, we have so many authors, uh, and, but uh, we can continue after the class. Okay, so mine, mine is a question. Yeah. So what yeah. I'm understanding is that in the easy cases, there can be a right answer because it's just laid out. But then in the hard cases, um, the judges, so in the hard cases, judges don't have discretion so what what exactly is the right answer then in hard cases because yeah. in if cases it's it's the the law is that it states but in hard cases if if Dworkin is saying the judges don't have discretion then what exactly will the answer be well uh, okay uh, <laughs> so, the hard cases are the cases that you cannot resolve easily. <laughs> it's the same words, no? Uh, in those with, you, with the rule of law, you cannot resolve easily. Um, it is not so clear. As you will read in works that in Dorkin doesn't distinguish very precisely, very well uh, between these two kind of cases. And uh, some critics, you will say, <laughs> will say that that well, probably in the way that, that he is defining that, uh, well, all cases are hard, all cases, <laughs> uh, because you can give so many interpretations. In any case. <laughs> It's uh, the problem is to try to understand the, the the connection of these two concepts. No, if the legal system has some kind of integrity, probably just will be one answer. And this is the the argumentation, the final ar argument of Dawkins. And, uh, and to find uh, that answer, probably 
in the hardest cases we need a, a judge with a, a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge to, to, to find that answer because you in the legal system have all the tools to resolve this case. Yeah, more or less it, it is the approach of Jordan. Well, I want to, to continue with the next authors, very strange authors, <laughs> you will see, of the American and Scandinavian realism. And we will begin with the American realism. No? The, there are so many authors, very interesting, like this one. I don't know if some of you, any one of you recognize this photo, this picture of Fuller Wilson Holmes Jr. Here he is, Jr. <laughs> Here is at the very beginning of his career. It's very interesting to understand more or less uh, the life of the people because the most of the times we will find in their lives the answers uh, that and the thought and the weight of and the, the causes that make the, the, the each thought of each author so he lived uh, in this time when there was a civil war, for sure you have heard about the civil war. He was in Massachusetts at that time, the Massachusetts Battalion. So uh, he was enrolled there, and, and but at the end of the civil war, he enrolled in Harvard Law School. It is very interesting to realize that at the very beginning, he uh, uh, didn't want to be in the law school. He was kicked into the law by his father, as he said. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. And the Civil War made so great impression to his mind. Why? Because uh, he, he realized that the one part of the country, the North, was fighting for the freedom against slavery, as you know. No, the South was fighting. They say they say that not only for slavery, because all the factories and all the things work with slaves, but it's principally the, the South was fighting uh, in the sake of autonomy. Autonomy, they say this now, huh? because the Federation wants to put orders to each state and they say, no, each state have to have freedom, autonomy to decide what kind of rules they will have. And so the Federation was in the North and anti-Federation in the South. More or less, this is, this is the approach. In any case, Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, realized that well, there could be so many interpretations and at the end of the day, who, what is the law? The law is the, the have to be in the, with the force in some, some sense. At the end of the day, what is the law? The law has to be what, what, what thing you have to do in each society. If I'm living in the South, the law will be one thing. And if I'm living in the, in the North, the law will be another thing. So I want to realize and to, to understand what at the end of the day, in the reality, in the reality, they are American realists. So at the end of the day, the law is the thing that I have to obey. That's why he was against formalism and against utilitarianism. 
there was uh, so many teachings in Harvard University at that time of German idealist philosophers. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, for, for sure, uh, you will remember the jurisprudence of conceptions. Yeah, well, that is, is one of the authors that in Harvard at that time uh, you can find easily in the books of jurisprudence. Well, they say, well, uh, he realized that the legal system is not just poor logical uh, structure, organization of concepts, uh, uh, notions, and kind of that. So, what is the law? The lies of the law has not been logic. It has been experience. It, it has been experience. Remember, it's like not the civil war and what is the law? Well, not the things that you say in the north, not the things that you say in the south. It's the experience of each individual <laughs> in his life. So it is very interesting, a very influential uh, person, individual in the history of the United States. Why? Because he was part of the Supreme Court between the 1902 and 1932. 30 years in the Supreme Court. Wow, a whole life, 30 years. So, and he, he, many of the famous cases of the United States, well, he was involved like a president of the Supreme Court. It's incredible, no? It's very influential uh, man in the history. Well, now we have another photo, like uh, uh, a judge of the Supreme Court. At, at the end of the days, this was a photo. Uh, so, Oliver Weldon, Let's see. He supposed a form of moral skepticism and opposed to the doctrine of natural law. Remember, what is the law? The law is experience. It's what we think, think that could be law. Then, the common law is not a building omnipresence in the sky, but the articulate voice of some sovereign or quasi sovereign that can be identified. This is a very, very interesting <laughs> approach, no? He realized, well, what is common law? It's not something that is falling from heaven. <laughs> it's not that uh, uh, things that are in the nature that we just have to discover. No, it's the voice of some specific people, some specific individuals that have the power, that's why they are the sovereign in that case, no? the sovereign, no? or quasi-sovereign, quasi-sovereign that can be identified. It is very interesting. He, 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 that's why he said, law is not what it ought to be, have, have no relation with morality. Obviously, he thinks that the, the, that well, pro probably he he was not so deep in morality, but he saying well, it's not part of the morality. Either law is what the king says. Because so many times the king says something, and the experience of what is law is so different, no? The king of the England could say something, and then in the United States, they, or in any colony at that time, could, could be another thing that that uh, the people used to do. The, the laws could be interpreted in so many ways in different places around the same country. It's incredible. For sure, you you have the experience of these kind of things. So, the law 
No, it's what the legislators say. Because the legislators say so many things and so many times the constitutional court say no. Yeah, this, what you said that this law, it is not. <laughs> yeah, it is against the constitution according to our interpretation. So what is law? What, at the end of the day, is what the judge says. He realizes what is law? What I say. <laughs> he says it's, it's, uh, so, so many other things. No? Law is not reasons. It's not arguments. It's not logical. It's not anything. It's what I say. <laughs> or so you, you, you can remember some some of the French uh, revolutionaries of the 18th century <laughs> that say, well, uh, the law for many is the, what the king says. Well, well he says, well, who have at the end of the day the power? I, as a president of the, <laughs> in the Supreme Court of the United States. I think that it could be uh, just uh, a way to say the the, the ideas, you know? because he said there is law is not reasons. In a in a case law, in a decision of the Supreme Court that is full of decisions, <laughs> you can find a lot of re uh, reasons, a lot of arguments in that case law in that decisions decision uh, in, in where Oliver Wendell Holmes said, well, law is not reason, it's not argument, it's not any kind of that. And another famous uh, notion of law, law is what a man, a bad man cares. He, he said, well, do you want to know what is law? Well, uh, you have to look a bad man and uh, what kind of things he cares. Probably he cares only on the, for the material consequence, which such knowledge enables him to predict. If I do that, I will be in prison. So the law is not to do that. <laughs> not to do that. So what do you think about Holmes? You agree with him that law is what judge says? Uh, well, if you want, uh, Calvin, don't you want to say something? No. You're raising your hand. Or Collins, yes. Uh, sir, I have so many questions, but let me just... <laughs> <laughs> um, First of all, I don't think, maybe it's because I haven't internalized this thing so well, but I don't think he has made so much sense here because, for example, if we're taking one of the elements that he consider not to be law, um, which is what the legislator says, uh, I don't know how that comes into place because even if you bring in the constitution, who are the people behind the letters of the constitution? We know that, um, the legislator, it's upon them to make and or make laws. Of course, a rigid constitution may limit their powers in certain ways, but they can still alter that. The same way that whatever the legislator has deemed to be illegal cannot be deemed legal by a judge. So in that sense, law, law is not really what the judge has said, but what the legislator has said in that sense. And that's how I'm seeing it. Then on the aspect of um, law being what a bad man uh, uh, cares about, I don't think it makes so much sense to me <laughs> for so many reasons. One of them still going back to what I said before. What a bad man cares about is that which is probably laid down by a crown or put down in letters by the lawmaker. And now what the judge himself ought to interpret like based on the cases before them just bringing the 
the spirit of the law into, into reality per se. So even if we are agreeing with him that law is what the bad man cares about, then what the bad man cares about is not that which is coming from the mouth of the judge, but that which exists somewhere before the existence of the judge himself and all that you get. So that, that's, that's how I'm seeing it. And of course, this scenario is, it just looks like that of the, the, the theory of the gunman. There, I think there are just so many questions here. Yeah. Yeah, it's very provocative. For sure, you think about this, and probably you find so many reasons and so many things that are not not fit so well. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he can say it well. Well, the, who is the 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 ones who read the constitution? Well, the judge. The judge said, "Well, at the end of the day, the law is this." <laughs> this is another version of, of this. So Ruth, don't you want to say something? So, oh, sorry, sorry for that. Yes, I want to comment on something. So um, I'll focus on uh, what law is according to Holmes. So he talks about law is what the judge says. Uh, I'm really not convinced with his view. However, mm -hmm. I have nothing to rebut on. So maybe I'll see what other legal scholars have to say about it. And maybe <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll have an answer for that or a, a clear critique on that. Uh, I'll go to the next one, which is law is what a bad man cares. And specifically, he talks about only material consequences. So I have an issue with that because as a student who has gone through a class of philosophy, a bit of it, we were taught that uh, man has two dimensions, and that's the material and the immaterial. So yeah. the fact that he does not talk and encompass the two dimensions of man, it's not really convincing as well. Yeah. And generally, I think I would incline with the legal framework of Ronald, he made more sense compared to Holmes. Yeah, so that's that's just yeah. what I think. But don't you think that that well, I I think that it's easy to find some errors, some things that doesn't fit very well in any other. But try to think in the 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 part of the truth that they got. Mm. This is the the I think that this this is the best best approach to any author. Remember that Aristotle said, when a person tried to discover what is true, normally they discovered. Probably they have so many mistakes and errors and things that could be not so good. But try to understand which part of the true he discovered. Mm, okay. I think that at the end of the day, mm. What is law in a specific case? Well, probably is the, the, the word of the judge that judge this case, you know? Well, so uh, I, I want to, to uh, I, I will talk all with, so with Jang Li, uh, Nunda, and Natalie, but let's see some uh, other authors of the American realist to, to continue our debate because it will help to a lot to think about these kind of things uh, but not with just one author but also with two three sorry sir it's, excuse sir yes but just one question do you agree with Holmes yeah <laughs> I agree with all <laughs> Hard with Holmes, with but uh, I I think uh, I agree with him in the part that in the cases that judges uh, are involved, what is the law in that case? Uh, probably the things that the judge says, but uh, they need principles, rules, policies, and and ends aims this is a thing that 
uh, Dorkin never talked about, and so many other tools that I will expose to you in the complete theory of the law that uh, I will explain in two weeks. But in, the, in, in this complete, I will try to fit and to put all the authors uh, together, the, the, the good ideas of the authors in a good, uh, well, in a complete theory. In any case, well, let's continue with the, this author and then I will give it the word to Natalie. But now, uh, let's continue with this author. John Frank. John Frank is an author that used to smoke a lot. <laughs> Seriously. And, <laughs> and he's the most radical of American realists. Uh, so, in 1930, he wrote uh, a book based in, in some researches of psychoanalysis that he had at that time. But he's a lawyer, he's a lawyer, and he's, he's not uh, a, a doctor in any other field. So his thing after his studies that the, the law is a myth, and the basic legal is a myth. Uh, well, uh, the, well he, he was against the, the common understanding of the law. Why? Because he said, what is law? Yeah, probably the law at the end of the day is what the judge says, but how the judge uh, uh, decide each case? Well, no, it's because there is a, a constitution, and there is a, a law, a, high, a superior law, and you have to observe cases of the past and, the, and to maintain the decision on the start disease. So what really motivates each judge to decide each case? Well, it has to be with psychological factors. So for example, a judge can decide one case putting more attention, be focusing some witness more than others, giving more confidence to some witness more. Than, and why this? Because, well, here the judge can see the reaction of, uh, to different uh, people, no? One reaction for women and another for men. It is very interesting, no? And if the woman is Married or married, it would be two different approaches if the judge saw a, see a, a, a red haired woman or brunette or, or any other psychological factor <laughs> will happen. Uh, well, uh, it's some react reactions will have uh, this judge. And that, he will trust more, for example, in a man with a calm and deep voice than another that is, is speak, uh, shouting, uh, 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 and so on. So, and probably if the judge see uh, a man uh, with thick glass, will hear more than uh, another that seems to be, well, a uh, 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 crazy man of the street that not so much clothes and, and so on. So, and if he realized that some witness have nervous tics, he will be uh, aware and he tried to, well, what this man uh, will say, because I, I don't know if he is in his, uh, clear mind. <laughs> well, so many factors could happen to that uh, judge. And each one of them win, will change the decision, the final decision. There are a lot of factors that could be psychological factors. Well, 
And so this is the law. The, the reality, the reality of the law is not any rule, set of rules or set of, of case law or no. It's not just a psychological thing. Well, do you agree with Frank or not? Any of you? Natalie, do you want to say something? Um, yes, I wanted to say something before I answer the Frank question. Um, when you were answering Collins, you actually stated most of what I wanted to say, which is I find legal realism as a theory very appealing to me because what um, they're basically saying is true. I mean, obviously, we know at the back of our minds that mm -hmm. um, legislatures promulgate, uh, promulgate laws and whatnot, but at the end of the day, what is the law? It's when we go to court and what the judge says, and that is what is what the law is to my situation. So, and in many ways, this is what people are going to rely on when they're making decisions in the future on certain aspects. And then now I wanted to say about um, Jerome, uh, I think he made significant points because I always found it very pretentious uh, when we talk about judges as purely impartial persons because everybody comes with their own value systems it depends on the way you were raised the community you grew up in yes you can be to some extent open-minded but then we still have things that influence us as persons hmm. however i'm a bit i don't know if legal realism can stand on its own as a complete theory so on that i'm not very very sure but i think it's a very important um aspect yeah well, yeah, yeah, obviously it's an important aspect, but on the other hand, I would put, yeah, don't you think that, for example, if some man of the street killed directly uh, and in a bad way another man and the judge received that instruction with a lot of evidence that that was the man who killed the other, and the decision is only made by psychological factors? <laughs> I mean, not really, but you'd find that the sentence the judge gives is greatly influenced by psychological factors. I'd say that, that would be my answer. That sentence would re definitely reflect um, the judge's, you know, <laughs> perspective. <laughs> okay. So any other? wants to say something? Well, I want to say something. I also agree with Natalie because scientific study has shown that humans' decision-making abilities are influenced by their cognitive biases or some kind of physical discomfort. So yes, a judge is also limited by his human nature and may disregard important things in a case. And I think in the end of the day, it may affect the kind of decision that he makes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's see one author more of this uh, movement that you will enjoy a lot. And uh, this is Carl Levlin. So, uh, he's a poet, a pugilist. Don't you know who is a pugilist? Well, you, you have to find a dictionary, if not. Uh, well, and a linguist, and he say, well, all these kind of things are not real, are not real. This, this is very interesting, no? So, Roman law is high among the realities. Uh, yeah. Roman law, the history of law, policy, uh, well, so many things are not real. We have not to take care of these kind of things as, as the reality, no? We have to be focused in the reality. Now, what means to be focused in the reality for this guy? Well, to be focused in the functions of the law, because the law is a technique. For sure you remember that so many authors talk about the the law as a technique. Well, he, he tried to develop a little more this idea. Say, well, the, the law is a, a technology that helped us to something, 
to some purpose. What kind of purpose? It could be anything purpose. Could be good, could be bad. There is no value in itself. No, it's just a technique. Uh, and a technique has no sense uh, in itself. For example, uh, a gun, a gun. The gun is good or is it bad? Well, it depends. <laughs> if a gun is to, to fight, uh, with some animal to to food <laughs> to find food well, or to defend yourself from the nature well probably could be a good thing no but if if it is to kill some well uh, uh, but the technique in itself have no meaning have no value is not good or bad it is very very interesting this approach no and what kind of functions uh, will have the law? Well, the law have so many jobs, six specifically, yeah? an adjustment of trouble cases, a preventive channel of conduct and expectations, a preventive rechanneling of conduct and expectations to adjust to change, an allocation of authority, and the provisions of directions and incentive with the group, and the job of the juristic method, well, probably the most important uh, job, well, is to define uh, well, we, what we have to do in each case, no? specifically in the hard cases, no? in the troubled cases. No? Um, well, as you see, as you see, well, uh, so many authors of, of the American realists are very focused in the jurisprudence, no? very focused in the jurisprudence. And with the Scandinavian realists, they have uh, only one thing in common, no? is they, all of them are against morality in some sense, very sceptical approach to morality. Uh, and the values are very sceptical about any kind of values. Very sceptical about justice, no? Justice, what is justice? What is law? Is what the, the, in, at the end of the day, is the, the ones who have the power will say, no? And the ones who have the power will be, will be a sovereign, will be a judge, will be our, our mind, <laughs> you know, psychology, uh, and so on. But the very problem, the great problem of these authors is, well, that they never develop any kind of proof. If you want to make an approach, a psychological approach to the law, there is a subject that is legal psychology. Well, you have to develop so many uh, tools, so many experiments, like the Mil Milgram's experiment. You will remember that, that experiment that I showed to you in the last lesson, in the last lecture. Uh, so, but he, uh, he, those authors never did that kind of evidence to make uh, 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 the law uh, uh, a science. No, they said, well, we have to take care only the reality. Uh, we took off all the set of rules, all the all the principles, all the because this is. And, uh, but what is the law then? Well. Some psychological things, and they never, they never develop these kind of things. Let's see, let's see now. The Scandinavian author. What is what could be the the flag of the Scandinavian author? This one, or this one, or this one, or this one or this one? Well, obviously all of them. Why? Because in Scandinavia, you can find so many countries and all of them with the same cross, but different colors. You know? The cross of St. Olaf, St. Olaf. So, the first author that is just mentioned in the book of Wax is Axel Hagerstrom. Hagerstrom's say nothing unreal exists. Probably 
we can agree with this first phrase. Nothing unreal exists. If we understand that all things in the reality exist and the things that are not in the reality never exist. Well, this is a metaphysical question. No? What is the existence? What is the reality? This is a metaphysical. But they are against metaphysics. They say, well, the likes in the law exist in the reality, in the reality, in the reality that we can touch, that we can see, that we can hear. No, not at all. Law, like pink elephants, might exist, but without being real. <laughs> without being real. So, <laughs> the, 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 at the end of the day, the law doesn't exist. And this is a famous phrase of Cato of Rome. Uh, I think that could be you know, Cato is from the fourth century. He said, I think that Rome should be deleted, should be cancelled uh, in Latin. No? So Roman is delendum. So he changed the phrase and he says, Preteracceso metaphysicam, the metaphysics is the lendum, should be deleted, should be deleted. He said, well, it doesn't work uh, very well, all this kind of strange knowledge uh, called metaphysics. Uh, uh, so it is quite different uh, for approach. Uh, Let's see. Uh, yeah, they say just for for a fun moment that we are all, all that if we think that that reality in law is reality, we, well, we are crazy. We are in, in a space shift uh, in in a, a novel without Arturito behind us. No, so. <laughs> yeah. We he don't believe in us so much, obviously, you know. And um, let's go again with my typical back screen. <laughs> so, do you agree with uh, Axel Hagerstrom? Because he put more or less the rules to the Scandinavian school uh, about what is law. He said, forget all about. Uh, all about the notion, abstract notion, things that we cannot touch. Well, this is the Star Wars, no? <laughs> uh, you have to forget all about this. What do you want? Uh, the only thing that you have to take care of, and this is the school of Vine, uh, uh, Vienna, uh, that uh, say, well, the science can only build using using uh, ah, yeah using a uh, word that have some relation with one kind of thing of the reality the word of beard have relation with that beard that is there no? so we can use in science the word beard because there is a beard that we can see the word tree also helps because there is a tree and you can relate. But the word existence, you cannot is, use that because, well, or, or what the existence, well, more or less could be. And the principle of totality, no? What is totality? Well, so the, the great problem with this school, that this first uh, uh, philosophical school of the science, uh, how to understand the science, and then they use for the law is that they are against metaphysics. But this in, what is metaphysics? What is metaphysics? Well, metaphysics is the, the principle of, of ideas of our mind, of the law knowledge of each person. Hagerstrom said, well, we have to delete the metaphysics, but with this, approach he used another kind of metaphysics because his metaphysic is well an asceticism first uh, of the knowledge 
and, and then he, he, he think, yeah, only the material things allow us to make some kind of science. The other things is not properly a science. So this is another approach. This is, he has his own roots idea that we can call that, that roots idea uh, are his meta, metaphysics. So, the, let's see another author, Alf Rollers. Most of them used to smoke a lot, as you say, as you see. And he developed, uh, he developed the ideas of Hargestrom, yeah, anti-metaphysic, anti-values, anti-justice. Yeah, it it have, have nothing to do with the law. All metaphysics are a chimera, and there is no cognition other than empirical. How we know what is the law in each place and time? Well, principally observing, uh, looking things, no? Looking things, uh, well, seeing what happened in any case. It's a very interesting example of the game, chess, chess game. And he said, well, how we can understand the rules that are behind this game. Well, we can see how the players play this game. You know? And then if I see, for example, that the bishop is moving in this way, probably they, I will realize that the bishop should move only in, in, in the white, blocks, no? uh, not in the other. But if I saw the other bishop moving in the black blocks, well, I will discover some rules uh, and kind of that. No? It is very interesting. So, uh, how, obviously, I can read also a booklet about how to play chess. Uh, but probably, probably uh, there could be some omission. And at the end of the day, they are here. How to play any game? Well, I have to check. I have to check uh, all of all of the, well, uh, the books, and, but better is to check how the players play each game. And then I will realize how to play that game because there could be an exception of the book and so many players can put one, one more thing, for example, in chess, no? Uh, I have just one minute to move my, uh, any, any piece. And if not, the, the other it is a common rule that, that so many people used to, used to have, no? So, how can I know the, the rules of chess? Observing that rules in ways. Uh, the, the, the valid rules we can discover, well, when we see, uh, so see the effectiveness of the rules as established by observation and the extent to which the rules are regarded as binding. Well, it's not just observation because you know, I can see, for example, that so many people used to eat with the fork and the knife in some way, but they don't have the notion that it, it is a, a, a compulsory to do that, yeah? But uh, if they do regarding the, as abiding, probably, then I would discover what is the law in its case. And it's very, very interesting, no? Because he said the norms of the of chess are the abstract idea content of a directive nature which make it possible as a scheme of interpretation to understand the phenomenon of chess. The scheme of interpretation, it is the main notion of outdraws, the scheme of interpretation. Well, each rule 
should be uh, understand in each scheme of interpretation, in his own scheme of interpretation. If we will see just the bishop alone, probably it would make no sense. When uh, the, the, the figure of the, the bishop makes sense, when, when I put in again with its own rule and with its own scheme of interpretation. So, it is very interesting because no known has a, a priori validity. No known. We cannot say that uh, before we establish the scheme of the interpretation, uh, any known have any kind of validity. Norms only have meaning on a scheme of interpretation. Well, this is very, very interesting. Interesting, no? Uh, I think that this, he said, well, forget about, about natural law, common law, uh, and all these kind of things, no? all these kind of opinion. We have to see, well, well, this is the scheme of interpretation in each society, in each, uh, and then, we should follow this. Finally, I will to put one more author of the Scandinavian approach. Well, which one? This one. Carl Oliver Kron. Carl Oliver Kron said that again with more or less the, the same approach. It's a mix of Jerome Frank uh, and Austin, no? It's a mix. <laughs> well, what is law? Well, a form of psychology that had to be with coercion. What? Why have to be with co coercion? Because uh, when we uh, know what is law, when we show a symbol, a symbolic expression of something, a sign in the traffic that says that we cannot go in that way, uh, and a uh, uh, coercion, a punishment, a sanction. Well, I saw that sign and I continue in this way. Uh, well, then will be a policeman that stopped me and, and then he will put me a fine or put me in prison, I don't know. <laughs> and, um, so then my my mind will react, you know? my conscious will say, uh, well, when you see that time, you will react in some way. And more or less is when you see the symbol or conscious man say, you shall not to do that. This is stop, stop. Mm. So it is the law, just a reaction uh, in a symbolic expression, more, more or less like what Frank said, no? A monopoly of force is required in order to the psychological basis of the law to be effective. Yeah, if there is no coercion, there will be no law. Mm. Yeah, this, more or less uh, have some similarities with the Austinian approach, but uh, with a mix, with a cocktail of psychology. You know? So finally, uh, if there is, remember, remember, for all these authors, the notion of values or of reason of arguments make no sense. Make no sense. No? Uh, they have. They want to study the reality, the, what is at the end of the day, the, the law. So if there is no value, if there is no morality approach, uh, why the law says one thing or, an, or, an, or another, no? Uh, well, it's not because it is just, because they are against metaphysics, values, and no, it's because just, uh, because each one, one uh, have his own will, his own interest. Law reforms are moved by self-interest. So, and finally, seems to be a contradiction because for 
some of them, especially for Oliver Cronin, uh, at the end of the day, they say, well, what is morality? Like morality standards are the, the legal standards. They identified both of them. No? If, for me, what is uh, good or what should be that the, the things that the law say that are good and the, what are bad things, the things that the law say that are bad things. Well, I don't know if, if what do you think about these guys? <laughs> the Scandinavian realism. Uh, if you have any question, if you agree uh, uh, with these authors, I don't know how many of you agree with uh, some author. Sally, you are raising your hand. You yeah, while I wanted to ask, yeah. what is the relevance of these authors considering the fact that they leave us with nothing, they just criticisms but leave us with nothing in as much as we can use their criticisms to understand the faults with the other authors but that they leave us with nothing makes it difficult for me to understand their relevance that... yeah the relevance well <laughs> well i think that we still discovered that they got one part of the truth that you will see the relevance. If you think that all these people are crazy people <laughs> that uh, smoke, I don't know what. <laughs> so probably you will never find the relevance of these authors. So we try to discover what kind of truth could be behind that word. No? I, I, I will uh, answer finally uh, in two weeks when I expose the complete theory of the law, at least for me. But it's very try to understand now what kind of truth that they discovered. Although <laughs> when they say that there is no truth, yeah, probably. Well, Joy. Um, I wanted to sort of disagree with Carl. Um, I think saying that law is a technique um, sort of takes law to mean that it operates in a vacuum as opposed to a society and that's not the function of law because if law operates in society and a society has values then in order for law to legislate on in society then it needs to have inherent values yeah that's why um sometimes you can say that law stems from morality because some of the things that society values are also coded in law and i just have a question with regards to alf ross um i think his conception of chess is really interesting but my concern would be if like in the rules of chess um, the rules are there, but everyone has a different technique and a different understanding of playing their game. So is that his conception of law, that everyone must understand the law differently and apply it in a way that they know best? Yeah. Yeah, but it's a question about the rules. Yeah. Yeah, we will see rules in, in the next minute. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And someone else? Just one more. Duta, don't you want to speak? Uh, yeah, um, I think I I like their psychological approach to law. Um, the fact that they say that the the human mind is response to social pressure which the law imposes. I think that's something that not many legal scholars bring out, and it's something that we probably don't notice that the law actually affects how we think when something is prohibited. Um, eventually in your mind, you will be conditioned not to do that thing. So I really like their psychological approach. However, I think with all of these theories, they are f I think that each of them are flawed in their own ways. They have their truth, but if taken alone, it cannot be enough to justify a legal system. 
So I think that each of these theories should be taken all together. You take the good parts of each theory and come up now with one proper theory of law and legal systems. Otherwise, when taken alone, most of these theories are actually defective. Yeah, yeah, effectively, effectively are defective. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, if you say the, the man will never have solidarity, you will say, well, <laughs> the conclusion is law reformers are moved by self-interest only. It, it is clear, no? But it is very interesting because uh, they realized that psychology uh, have a big role in the law. Nowadays, there is a, a, a subject, legal uh, psychology. Very interesting, especially for the criminalist uh, uh, authors. They have to know a lot of psychology to understand the victim, the, the, the the criminals and so on. So let's go ahead. Uh, well, if you have uh, some other question, uh, we can deal with them. But after the class, uh, or in the next part of the class, let's talk about a little about utilitarianism and, and some just one author. What is utilitarianism? Principally, it's a form of consequentialism. So you will, uh, you can ask, what is consequentialism? Don't you know? I don't know if any of you can distinguish. Consequentialism is a part of a, a, an approach of morality. There are two kinds of morality, probably more, but principally the classical morality and the consequentialist morality. Any of you uh, can describe me the difference between these two kinds of moralities? Don't worry if, if you can't, but, but I want to know how much do you know about morality? Yeah, uh, Duta. Um, I think as from what I read in the article, the difference between um, consequentialism and uh, non-consequentialist morality is that um, the first one, it focuses, morality is based on the possible consequences of your actions. So, it, the morality of an action is based on the consequence but with this the opposite um morality is based on let's say um the author refers to it as an unequivocal past fact so it's a yeah past okay yeah I, yeah good that you read that i think that wax is not so clear in this is uh, because he said well consequences only see the future and classical morality only see the past. And it's more or less true. What is, uh, what is the classical morality? The ones that I explained you in the first lecture. Why we should do things? Well, because there is, uh, we have to think how each human can flu flourish and develop himself can achieve his aims, can achieve, at the end of the day, his happiness, yeah? The most important thing, the morality is the happiness of each human life, of each human life, and it means the flourishing, the developing, the, so many things, to achieving his own aims and so on. And for uh, the consequentialists, well, they see uh, that the most important thing to, to realize uh, that uh, some action is good or bad is to see what is the consequence in the future. The consequence in the future. And in the version of utilitarianism is what is the, uh, the consequence should, should be the maximum welfare possible. So the, the 
principal aim to achieve is not happiness, it's the maximum welfare. Yeah, now you, you more or less, uh, this could be the, the main definition is just to remember things and to, to make uh, you easier the rhythm of words. Well, so rightness or goodness of an action is logically independent of its, its consequences. Uh, yeah, uh, so to consider if one action is good or bad, you have to see the consequences, not just, uh, well, the, 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 the typical approach, the classical approach is more rich. Well, you have to, to, to see if one action is good or bad, you have to see first the aim, then the intention of the people, the aim, objective aim, and the intention, the subjective aim, no? why are you, I'm doing this? Yeah, uh, also the circumstances, you have to check now in what circumstances, in what place, uh, what you are trying to do, and so many other things. Obviously the consequences, in, well, it's important, but as a name, no? as a name. Uh, so you can decide, for example, two cases, no? I kill another man because... Uh, yeah. uh, I kill another man because I hate him. Or I kill another man because I, uh, he was trying to kill me and I was defend myself from from him and that's why I accidentally or not so accidentally but defending myself uh, I killed the other for the for the consequentialist and then in both cases you see that there was a man who died after me and you had to be punished because it is a not, not a good consequence consequentialist is not very aware of the intentions of the people. Yeah, in this easy case for, for Putin. The, the classical morality, see what, what was your, your, your intention? Oh, it's concerned only with the maximizing welfare. It's been the, the utilitarianist version of the consequentialist, consequentialist morality. Which can be the problem? Well, first, the uh, principal aim is not the, the, at the end of the day, the, each human individual that uh, is the maximum welfare. No, it means that if for the maximum welfare you have to kill one, and all the people will be very happy with this. Well, you, you can kill anyone. It doesn't matter if he was guilty or innocent. It doesn't matter. It helps to to the to the maximum welfare. Well, that will, will humans are means means to achieve maximum welfare. No? The value is not as persons, but as experience of pleasures. Yeah, remember, remember the classical approach to morality. No? We have to develop each person as much as we can. The flourishing of person, this is another word that is very used by Finnish, the flourishing of, of the people. You know, uh, yeah, uh, and, and to achieve their aims. On the other hand, uh, Utilitarians say no. The, the billion is not the person; is is the welfare, but a welfare understood like a pleasure, material pressure. And the, the, we we have to give as much as much as we can to the people to. Exp it's not person that should be flourish and should develop himself. It's, it is not them. It's just to to give the they then some experiences. And finally, 
how far into the future can we extend the consequences of our actions? This is the one of the greatest problems of any utilitarian or of any consequentialist. For example, I put one example. No? I can give an um, all no, well, one thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to a man who needs to to uh, to well so many things in his family, and I saw that his children uh, have no university. So I decided, well, I will pay the university of these children. Uh, and you can say, well, this is a good thing. It's a good consequence, no? But then it happened that all of the children of that man, that poor man, became uh, criminals, no? Became politicians and and they, uh, well, grow and do so many things in that country and was, and at the end of the day, they uh, end in the jail because they all was a, a part of a band of crim uh, criminal uh, activities. So my action was good or was bad. <laughs> yeah, we can see. Well, the, the first consequence it was good. The second was bad. And this, this, and then, and then, and then, and then. So. I will never be able to to realize if my action was good or was bad, <laughs> because how much we can go to the future to analyze each each action is not so clear. So, but this is more or less the main notions of of consequentialism of utilitarianism. Now we can see this guy that have to be with a law. This is Richard Posner. He's very, 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 very famous. Uh, Before we continue, can I ask a question? Okay, just name. You can do. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. So I'm I'm a little bit confused in utilitarianism and consequentialism in particular because you in your slides you've written that um, it's independent. So the action is independent of its consequences do you mean dependent yeah because okay yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I, I just copy literally one phrase of work of his book and um, probably it's not so clear <laughs> yeah i agree <laughs> so that means that utilitarianism so what you mean is not independent, but it is that utilitarianism looks at the consequences of your actions, yeah. which is dependent on the action itself, not independent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's why uh, I was trying to explain. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And that's why I was trying to explain that for the classical morality, uh, you have to analyze so many things. The the action in itself the intentions of the actions, the circumstances of the actions also, and the and the and the way, the means of the action, the, how is developed that action. Yeah. For the utilitarians, all these things, well, it's not so important. Just see the consequences. Yeah, that's why there is some independence. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. That is Great. clear. Thank you. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's go again with Richard Posner. He's a judge. He's a clever judge. I think that he's a very influential judge in the history of the, of the United States. Uh, he said, judge decide hard cases by choosing an outcome which will maximize the wealth of society. How they decide cases, no? Well, seeing what kind of consequences could be in in the years, not just in that case, no. Uh, the years of each case, no. That's why. Uh, bec why? Because 
the next judge that will succeed me uh, will 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 have to say the same that I said unless uh, they have strong reasons to change his his mind obviously no but uh, as a principle uh, they have to follow so when I remember he is a judge uh, when I uh, decide some case I have to take care of what will be the consequences so in this case and in all the next cases and in the society no? and the consequences could be good or could be bad could be well if I put in in the jail some criminal probably could be a good consequence because criminality could could decrease and if I I know that this man is criminal and I don't do anything probably uh, probably it will be not so good thing yeah because there will be some more insecurity and security in the streets and so on and also if I put a uh, some decision in, in in economy there will be a lot of consequences if this axis of good or not no there will be a lot of consequences so in this way he, he is a very renowned name in economics because uh, well he talked about so much the relation between law and economy he develops uh, uh, he thinks that the, the law is developed by uh, some conditions are conditioned by social and economic forces so you can see that there is two ways of understanding the law and the economy no? the economy condition the way of developing the law and the law condition the economic the, the develops of each society there, there there are two ways in which kind of things someone told me uh, asked me about a break but we have a break of 30 minutes because i was my delay so sorry uh, in in any case i will put all this this lecture uh, in youtube so you will have if you want to make a break by, by yourself but i will continue with this uh, lecture because i have not so much time so sorry uh, i hope that just will be today so uh, what about this uh, approach this is a very interesting approach i think so because uh, there the, uh, there is a lot of new concepts uh, that Posner put in the field of the law uh, that will help so many judges to uh, develop the arguments better. What kind of new notions he put? No? For example, the notion of optimality. Uh, there is optimality. I don't know if you have heard something about this. The, the optimality of Pareto. Pareto is uh, well, an economist from Italy that said what, uh, that talk about efficiency in the market, in the market, but in a specific way. Uh, thinking, for example, if I produce uh, 100 devices or cell phones or any, anything, there should be 100 uh, people that buy it. Yeah. So the demand and the, the offer, the offer and the demand should be exactly the same in order to be uh, efficient in that market. Because if you produce more and nobody wants these devices, 
probably there will be a lot of in inefficiency in, in that market. It, it doesn't have to be, uh, it is good to, to clarify with the uh, equality, because for example, uh, if you produce 100 devices and in this population of 100 people, just the 5% about the devices, but each one by two, it means that all the offer uh, is equal or all, all the demand, yeah? The, the demand of the people, the, the, the request of the people of that devices, but the half of the population will never have any device and the, the other half will have two. But the, the optimal of Pareto will be okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, it's a thing that uh, works very well with, with well, some economic flaws. Uh, the, the, oh, another con uh, new concept of, of Richard Posner, no, the transactional cost. And it is very clever, I think. So, so he said, well, if there is no transactional cost, there will be more transactions and the, and the rules of the Market will will be will operate in an efficient way. It will be will be an efficient market. No? And it is very clear also. No? Uh, he he won, I think, one great prize with this idea. No? If, for example, if I the easiest example, no? if I put a lot of taxes, probably there will be less transactions. No or transactions quite strange. For example, so many people used to sell things without paying taxes, without bills, because they have to pay taxes. Well, to avoid these kind of things uh, and to promote the transactions, we have to avoid all the cost of that tra transaction. And because it's not only the a monetarian, but also have to be, for example, with information. If I don't know so much about one company or what kind of things will have my new cell phone, if it's good, it's, it, it is runs very fast or not, well, probably I will be, I will be, have some obstacle, maybe hindered of acquiring that device. Well, but if I reduce all this transactional cost, probably then uh, it will be easy to uh, to to, uh, to the market to be efficient, you know? or damage cost, or precautional cost, or, or another thing that is the game of theory, you know, uh, that is an economic uh, theory very, very clever, I think so, that says, well, people are not angels. Angels think always perfect, no? We, we are rational people, but not only rational, we move also by our feelings, no? We have some feel, but our, our, our mindsets, some other things that, so at the end of the day, life is like a game yeah we did we do things just for gambling yeah and that's why uh, the economic this economic approach say well there are so many reasons that this gambling yes uh, that we have to take care in each market so you have to take care in the same way that that uh, the law is not absolutely rational there are so many people gambling <laughs> in, in our society and so on but well with this with this approach is very interesting i don't know what do you think richard posner have reason what, what kind of problems he could have uh, do you agree with richard posner his point of view. He developed a, a great subject. Nowadays, you can find 
so many LLMs uh, and courses about the economical approach to the law. And it's very, very, very deep. And I think that uh, he, he was an expert in these kind of things, more than Frank in psychology. <laughs> yeah, Duta, don't you want to say something? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Or a kind of like a reaction or whatever. Anyway, I agree with what he says about law um, and economic factors. But one of the criticisms against his theory or this economic analysis is some some critics ask, what does it have to do with justice? And I feel like I I kind of agree with them because I understood the part about how um, economics affects law and how both of them um, affect each other. But I didn't really see, like, the theory of justice was not as stark for him. Yeah, it is very interesting, yeah. And what about justice for this guy? <laughs> Had something to do with law, or, or we are just consumers, customers, well, people that, that just use material things, but sell. No, it seems to be that there is not a space for solidarity, no? Natalie. I, I agree with Nduta. I think Nduta's point was among what I wanted to say. Also, um, I feel like it's very unsatisfactory. It, it, it's right. It's very um, smart, but... Are we just people who just think about our wealth and our money? And I feel like it's very, it's just one-sided. It's wholly one-sided. Yeah. He doesn't talk about the human being in other aspects as much. Yeah. 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 It is the principal critique to Richard Postman. Now, what about solidarity? What about solidarity? You know? So, uh, yeah, I think that he's writing all these things that we have to take care of the economical approach. And uh, I think that probably all of the authors got some part of the truth. Obviously, obviously law have to be with psychology, obviously. But it's not probably the principal thing. No? Obviously law have to be with judge and the decision of the judge are crucial. But it's not just the decision of the, the, the judge, no? Um, well, but, it, but it, it is very, very interesting. I think that is a great author, more than others, obviously, because he, he put a lot of concepts to in, 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 in the field of the, of the law that are very useful. It helps us a lot, no? But that's why we can uh, understand now why John Rawls was so famous, John Rawls, because he talked, no, law have to be with justice. Law have to be with justice, and is probably the principal part of the law. Uh, justice and solidarity, well, it's not so clear that uh, he, he talked about another concept. No. John Rawls. Well, first, he, he refused to accept that inequalities even in the secure maximum welfare. This thing, no? That, that it's very interesting, no? Uh, because in the, in the free market model, there, there are so many inequalities. No? And he said, well, it is not just, no, it's not just that there should be inequality. The first question uh, is not to maximize the welfare of any, in any market. The first question is, is justice. It's have not to be with happiness, but with justice. What is right as a prior to what is good. What do you think about this, this priority? Do you agree with roles in this? Justice is fierce than happiness. But this right is prior 
have some priority with what is good. Yes, Georgina. Um, I think I, I agree with him because always <laughs> what is just will bring happiness. Of happiness, I mean justice should justice will always come first because after justice you'll be happy. There's nothing you can't be happy when things are unjust. So justice first, then you, then happiness. So you are, in, in, you agree really absolutely with Kelsen that remembered or the speech that I uh, uh, put to you in the last lecture, and that is justice is happiness. <laughs> Well, I don't agree with these kind of things, that justice is happiness. Yeah, but because there is so, so many differences, no? Justice is just the minimum. Well, in any case, some other wants to say something, or you, Georgina, want to add? Just to add, okay, it's not that justice correlates with happiness, but... Um, Oh, yes, okay, fine. No, it's fine. Just <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Rosalind. Oh, yes, um, when he talks about what is right being prior to what is good, I think they come as a package. I don't think they can be separated in that what is right is good, and if it's good, it's right. I don't think you can separate them. Yeah, but which one should have the priority? That's what I'm saying. I think they come as a package. If it's good, it's right. If it's right, it's good. It's one thing. Good. In which sense is it have the, the priority? Okay, I'm not sure which one should have the priority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Anjando. Um, yeah. Hi. So, uh, um, what I understood from John Rawls' idea of right having priority over what is good is because he thought utilitarianism focused on the overall good and forgot the individual right. Um, so I think the individual right comes first, then the, the overall good of the community. Yeah, okay. Well, okay, let's see. Uh, I think uh, that probably uh, justice has priority and probably happiness has priority. <laughs> well, it seems to be a contradiction. Yes, it's a contradiction, but it's just a, a matter of the point of view. Uh, so, remember our first lecture, and I say, well, what about morality? Morality have to deal with, with happiness, and the first question of morality is not the rules, it's not the, the things that you have to do. The first question is happiness. In this sense, happiness is the first question of all human order because all human order have to be ordered with one aim. The aims put the rules of each order. For sure, you remember, there is no order without aim. And that's why happiness is the first question of the morality and also with the legal system. The legal, because this legal system is also a human order. So, in this sense, morality have the priority. But on the other hand, when you think like a politician, well, what things I have to achieve in each legal system? The first question is about justice. Because I can imagine, I cannot try to give to the people, food, house, yeah, communications, internet, and so on. If first I don't give well some security of their lives, 
<laughs> I, can, I can produce the maximum welfare, but uh, never uh, protecting their lives and their, their, their health. Yeah, would be a city of dead people. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing, probably, uh, it says uh, you can read this in so many constitutions about around the world. The first aim of the state is to protect the human rights or the fundamental rights of the people. Yeah, uh, it's a question of the first question in this sense. In this sense, uh, is uh, to assure to secure some justice. It is very interesting, but it's not the principal question in, in absolute terms. It's the principal question in basic. To me, in terms of first, I have to uh, secure life, food, and, and the rights of the people in order to, uh, to make it possible to the people to achieve greater uh, aims. Yeah, the greater uh, aim is not to eat, <laughs> obviously, no? there is something greater than eat. That you have to assure the food of the people to, to you know, so there will be possible to the people to achieve greater ends. Well, in any case, in any case, yeah, let's go ahead with this also. Yeah. So he he defines justice of fairness. It's a a simple definition. He didn't develop this notion of fairness or, or justice as fairness just he said no justice is fairness but i think that we can say that for justice this this kind of fairness is very deeply related with the notion of freedom and of equality we will see in why the next uh, slide but but is very related in, in, in his mind he, he cannot separate divide fairness justice and freedom and equalities there is not justice without freedom there is not justice without equality yeah then we will see no and he, the, the last thing thing that we can say that this is uh, a remaker, what you do have heard. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You are seeing me? Perfect. I have a, uh, for sure, you have heard uh, so many about so many films, uh, remakes of uh, antique films. No. Sent, uh, of, well, of hundred years uh, of years ago, no? Yeah. Well, he uh, made a remake of an antique theory, of the theory of the social contract. For sure, you will remember some uh, contractorist people, no? John Locke, Rousseau, Jean Jacob Rousseau, uh, or or, or Hobbes or and so many authors there are so many authors in that uh, century that talk about the social contract the social contract that we must see or kind of that in order to to try to understand more or less how could be our constitution our contract in each society how, well, and we also saw that there was so many critiques. For sure, you remember Maine. No? It's an uh, historical contract, the social contract. No? Well, we have now a new version of the social contract, the version of John Rawls. That is in, in, in new terms, in new, with new conditions. And it is very interesting. It, he doesn't uh, uh, take care about 
which kind of people could be there. No? Remember, for luck, for also the social contract is between uh, good people, for hopes, and, uh, uh, between wolves. You know, what he said, well, we, we don't know uh, what kind of people could be uh, in the social contract. No? There is uh, the best way to understand justice, the best way to understand justice is to put a veil in the in the eyes of any any people of the society, no? At the veil of ignorance. So in this way they will never know uh, in which position they appear in each society. For example, if some of you don't know uh, if you are men or women uh, if you don't know the color of your of of yours self well if you don't know which kind of interest you have if you don't know if you are rich or poor if you don't know and so on well so then you will be able to decide better what is just what is fair and it is an example, a uh, common example. So let's imagine that you could be in, true, in three circumstances. Circumstance number one, circumstance number two, and circumstance number three. And in the circumstance number one will be, I don't know, your man or, or woman, uh, if you are rich or poor, poor, or, and so on, yeah, so circumstance number one, uh, you can have three kind of decisions no? in your group, in the social contract, with this veil of ignorance. The decision number one, you will lose if you are in the, in the number one. In the decision number one, you will lose 700 pounds. In the decision number two, you will lose 800 pounds. In the decision number three, you will lose nothing, but you will gain 500 pounds. On the other hand, uh, if, if you are in the, in the decision, in the circumstance number two and number three, you always gain, you always gain always and you will gain in the circumstance number three a lot a lot a lot so he said well what kind of decisions this new community that have the veil in their eyes uh, uh, what will will have no which kind of decision they they will have. He said, well, there should be just one answer. The, the answer that allows us, uh, them, if they are rational, if they are rational, if they are rational, they will have just the decision number three. Why? I don't know what, what this uh, decision you will have in this circumstance. But he said, well, decision number three is clear because with decision number three, it doesn't matter if, if I in circumstance number one, two, or three, but I will never lose. I will never lose. Yeah, obviously, with another decision, I can expect more results. I can win more. But the principal decision is not to lose, not to lose. No? And that's why any rational man will decide decision number three. I don't know if you agree with this. Do you agree with this? Okay, perfect. Seems to be. So, um, Many people say, well, there are so many people that used to have 
to uh, that really enjoys a lot of risk and will decide some so other thing that but he said well that all the society is not crazy no and so we will decide that we can put the same question not just with game no but with a lot of circumstances obviously no you are yellow <laughs> white or green <laughs> i don't know man woman old elder younger or from one race from one country or from one religion or from another um, and so on which kind of decisions you will put in this veil of ignorance which kind of decisions we will put well Finally, he said, but if you, we have to choose, well, there will be just two conclusions, no? two principles of justice. The first principle is that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties. First principle, obviously compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. Liberties. Liberties is the first principle. We have to give to all people liberties. No? Yeah. The second principle, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that, that they are both to the, to the greatest benefit of the least advantage consistent with the just saving principle and attached to offices and positions open to all under condition of fair equality of opportunity. So they realize, well, first we have to give all the rights, all the liberties, as much as we can to all the people, no? This new contract. Uh, and then we have to avoid the, the losers. Remember, no? the uh, rational man will never put in risk so much, in, in, in so much thing. He, he will never want to lose so much. No? So to avoid these uh, losings, we have to, to put a system with an equality of opportunities. Yeah. So, what do you think about this 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 methodology? This uh, the day of ignorance, Arthur. Um, actually, what I had was a question. <laughs> okay. I think I think I understand what he meant by um, the veil of ignorance and um, the likelihood that people would choose better conditions if they were if they knew that they would be subject to the worst conditions, they would try to make society better. So I understand what he meant there. But my question is to do with um, the two principles of justice that you mentioned. And I was wondering, um, do they have anything to do with um, the advent of affirmative action? That we have to do anything with, sorry? With, um, with, like the growth of the, the, do they have anything to do with the fact that we embrace affirmative action? Well, affirmative action, uh, well, the, 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 the thing that the rule says is a methodology just uh, to understand which kind of rules should govern in each society. Yeah, this, this is the main idea. Uh, and the, the basic rule, the rules that uh, they uh, should be. So there will be so many other rules and organizations. And, but this, uh, I think that, uh, for with, what is that methodology? This is the main question. Uh, I am asking that, yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, I am asking that, no? What, for what? reason is but I, 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 first I, I, I make first question I will answer just a little 
but then is, there is another one that wants to say something. I don't know. What is the problem with this methodology or, or the success? This was a very successful theory. Many of the scholars, so many, talk about uh, the, the veil of ignorance. No? Yeah, we have to apply this or, or this is the problem and is peace. Yes. Um, I think it's very impractical because people already know what they are, like it's down to the identity. So now trying to put a veil of ignorance, that will be very hard. And then again, that will shed, like it will water down the aspect of people's heritage and identity. It's like saying we wipe all that off and that's a bit, I don't know, I feel like that's so bad because why would you want mm -hmm. to yeah. wipe off everyone's identity in the name of trying to um, equalize or something of the sort? Yeah, I just think it's very impractical and yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, uh, and for sure you will remember men that say, say that the social contract is a, an a historical const, contract no it's not in the history you can never do that <laughs> and more than that the uh, the veil of ignorance you will never have any kind of veil yeah uh, natalie uh, I just wanted to say that um, I agree that it's impractical, but I feel like the the way he talked about it was very was very helpful in understanding how maybe when if people weren't able to see who they are, they'd be fairer in the in the laws that we promulgate, you know, in the punishments that we meet out, people would be fairer. And then also, I just wanted to say that I think um, John Rawls' um, theory was. Was, it was quite transformative because it was centered on disadvantaged people. He really, I don't think I've read before, the people we've discussed earlier, I don't think any one of them has really talked about disadvantaged people in as much as he has. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's right. And that's why it was very, that's why this theory was very successful, no? Very, very successful, no? And so many scholars in, around the world uh, now uh, are talking about, well, you cannot do that because uh, you have to be in the circumstance of the other people and try to forget about yourself and think that in, in the other people. It is a, a methodology that could help so much to understand why we have to do things and what kind of decision we have to take. Yeah, I, I agree. Also with you, <laughs> Georgina. Okay, um, I, mine was just. Mine, mine was just. Uh, Peace has already said it. Um, but I just wanted to say, I didn't when when I was when I watched one of the videos you suggested, in the optional videos. There was a lady called Susan Ock who said he was seemingly conservative in representation of women in this theory. How was he, I didn't understand, how was he conservative towards women? Yeah, uh, well, I re well th there could be so many uh, positions <laughs> in this uh, and how is, I have to see that video again to understand very well because I don't remember that part of the video. Uh, in any case, uh, you can see thing that could be conservative or not, it depending, well, what do you understand of conservative, no? If you, there's a part of the feminist movement that is a, that used to fight so much <laughs> and to put some inequalities in favor of the woman, so with the veil of ignorance, these inequalities probably will not be allowed. Probably in this way she was saying that, but I don't remember so well, so 
I cannot answer so much. Finally. Um, so, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Because I can try to answer Georgina. Sorry, Tasneem, please go ahead. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Maybe you can add on if I miss out anything. So do you mind if we answer Georgina? Because I think I can answer her question. Okay. Okay. So in the video, what I understood was that um, the author, the female author, Susan, um, what she was saying is that in Rol, considering the um, original position, when he was considering this lack of gender, he considered fe women as mostly in relation to the family and in relation to certain roles, but he didn't consider women as rational beings as an, and as individual thinkers. And that's why um, this female author decided, um, had the criticism of the theory because she said that his idea of women was in general very narrow but he later remedied this ideal in his second book. Yeah, uh, well, I think that we have to take care of these kind of things with more detail because I think that is, it would be also a critique to his position in so his specific position in some topic of feminist, of the role's position. Yeah, and not specifically with the theory of the veil of ignorance. But on the other hand, on the other hand, we, it is very interesting to look again this this theory. Which are the limits of the theory? I, mean, uh, I, I think that it works so good for some things and so bad for other things. Probably the veil of ignorance so many times is so ignorant. <laughs> yeah, the veil of ignorance. Think about this. We are trying now to make, uh, to design the rule of this game, chess. <laughs> the veil of ignorance will help us to, to design the rules of this game. No, never, <laughs> never. What you will say, well, the, uh, the bishop, uh, bishop, how do you, do you want to move? Uh, in which way? Well, with, if you ask all of them, <laughs> all of them, they will say, well, I want to move in any sense. Yeah. Uh, and I want to jump and I, all of them, if you ask all of them. Yeah, you can say, well, uh, it, it, it is not imaginable to, to do that. Well, but we can say the same if we put some roles to each, each of them, no? But then there will be no veil of ignorance, no? Then each one will, so, you, we can decide in abstract world, there will be a businessman and there will be a researcher and there will be an activist and, and so on, but, we have to define, to define, in order to realize uh, what things could be good for one society. And for example, for what is designed this method? Because it is a method. It, I don't know if you realize that it is a method. And for what is the method of the veil of ignorance? Well, to to to, it's a method to 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 make societies more plural. So the methodology doesn't work very well if you have not a, a society, for example, a, a, a town with all people, 100% people there with one religion, with one race, with one point of view. But this methodology will not work there you can say, no, with this methodology, in that town, you have to put 10 churches with 10 different religions. <laughs> yeah, because each religion could be, you can be in any religion. But yeah, and if all the society is have the same religion, what happened? Well, probably is the veil of ignorance is too ignorant to... <laughs> to have any conclusions in that society. On the other hand, could be work 
people work very well here in London. In London, where I'm living, uh, there is so many cultures here, so many cultures, so many religions, also it's very cosmopolitan society. So the veil of ignorance could be a good methodology to some decisions here in the city, in the city. Yeah. So we have to take care. Uh, never could be so ignorant the bill of ignorance. <laughs> uh, it is the, the main question. Well, we have one uh, one uh, author more that we have to see. Uh, remember, uh, that's why I conclude with the same thing that I said at the very beginning of the explanation of rules. Rule says that the principle of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. So, what is the notion of justice for 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 rules? Justice is, he said, is fairness. But at the end of the day, is if uh, liberty is freedom and is also not only freedom but is equality both. But the principal notion is freedom for for roles and the second notion for roles is equality Durkin will change will say no the first notion is equality but uh, uh, why equality uh, why equality why the equality is the first thing both things are rejected by this guy uh, who is this guy this guy is robert nasik Robert Nozick is, well, he said, obviously, there should be a justice, and justice is a, the central part of the, the legal system. But what is justice? It's so different. It's not to put all the people in the same level with the same, because each individual can develop his say, he, himself in so different ways yeah why to give the same house the same car the same cell phone to everyone no equality is not the rule of law it is not just it's just the the, the must just uh, the, the justice have to be of uh, assuring the freedom of each people to develop himself in any way in any way so so now we will see another quite different point of view so he's a free market libertarian uh, yeah he said well what is the aim of the state well the aim of the state is not to give the same things to the people no no it's not to give uh, any kind of IES, IRS, no public work. It's not the aim. It's not to give public education. It's not the state's patient. Uh, not social care. Not no nothing. No nothing. No. Uh, the only aim is in this way is more uh, close. To the classical philosophers' approach, philosoph political philosophers' approach, that is the the end of the state. Well, is just to to be a night watchman uh, to assure the freedoms of the people. To make nothing is a minimal state, and the state can only act. He realized that there would be some problem. Why? 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 Because the aim of the state is not to grow. <laughs> this is to re-empower, to give the power again to the private sector. No? So to defend the individual rights. And I think that he has some reason to say that. Because we can see now that well, for example, in education, in so many things, the state con uh, controls all things, all things, no? Is we are living more or less in the panopticum of Ventum, of Foucault. We are living 
always watch it, always control it and think, well, this is not the end of the state. The state of the, is, is to, to allow to the people uh, to have the, as much freedom as we can, as much liberty as we can. This is the aim of our, uh, of the state, at least for Nozick. So, and this is a, another argument. No? Should we have to donate any kidney? Shouldn't we? No, he said no, no one, no one should be compelled to donate anything. If you want to protect the people, the right of the people, the freedom of the people, you cannot compel to do anything, neither to pay taxes. Uh, uh, and if it's just was, it must be a minimal tax. Yeah, minimal tax. So, how the legal system should be developed, developed? Well, with two, three principles, the principle of acquisition, the principle of transfer, the principle of rectification. What it means each one? Well, uh, uh, how the people get uh, things. He, not so, uh, he not talk so much about property because property is a, a very well, a uh, developed notion, as he said, well, things, no, not how to acquire things, how to transfer things. And if there is some problem, some conflict between uh, uh, the things, well, there should be one man with the power to have any kind of rectification of these kind of things. He's talking about justice, but in so different world, way than George, and in so different way than Rawls. All of them agree that there should be some kind of justice, no? Uh, for Rawls, justice is principally freedom, freedom, but freedom in a plural way, yeah. Uh, for Dorkin is equality. Uh, and for Nasik also freedom, in some sense, uh, is equal, but freedom without any kind of limitations. No? Uh, for for the, uh, roles, there is so much limitation as much as you can in order to put equality in the society. Well, I wish well, that there could be so many approaches to justice. I don't know what do you think about Nasik. You agree with him? And you you think that is yeah, Natalie. Then you um, want? I feel like Nozick Nozick um Nozick's theory is very I don't know, I don't think um overly privatizing things also results in, in anything good. In fact, I do believe that private institutions have the same capacity where they're given that much power to also infringe on our freedoms and rights. And like when we see when he says things like um paying taxes and he talks about uh public education and relegating all these things to the private sphere, this is in a way going to enforce like perpetuate inequalities in a very um long term kind of way so i don't i don't agree with him mostly yeah. <laughs> okay ryan uh hi so um i only agree with him but only to an extent so <laughs> he's he's um totally libertarian uh, capitalistic idea is good for boosting economy but only in a way that um, promotes a lot of social classes and inequality to an extent. So for example, when he says that um, the state shouldn't provide public education, that, that only goes to a great extent to promote inequality. So the poor won't be able to access education. And I guess probably what he should be saying is the state can provide public education, but the state shouldn't necessarily be in charge of developing the curriculum. So what is to be taught, what shouldn't be taught. 
because um, we, we've yeah. seen the effects of that in possibly like um, Libya yeah, yeah, yeah. when Gaddafi was the president. But I, I agree with him, but not to the extent where he's the extremist capitalist. <laughs> then, you know, he, his first great book was about anarchism. And he declared that we have to put anarchists in, in, in the state because, but uh, free market anarchists, the, the state cannot do anything in the market. So there was another movement in the anarchist, uh, the traditional movement of anarchism uh, that said, no, you are not anarchist because you are not anti-capitalist. <laughs> so, and I, I think that anarchism is just not to have an authority, not to have rules. And I think that he is really an anarchist, yeah? But in, on the other side, <laughs> yeah, Calvin. Don't, Hello. Hello. Yeah, um, I am of the view that uh, his libertarian views are, I think, would be right for a society where everybody has some sort of equal distribution of income and everybody can have opportunities to, to funds or capital to advance their privatization interests. Yeah. But uh, if you take that theory and apply it to African countries, especially where people, I mean, more than 40% are living before the I mean, below the poverty line, in abject poverty, I don't think that uh, that theory can be applicable because already as it is, there's so much an equal, an equal um, distribution of income. And if you were to tell people now that, okay, fine, government will not step, government will do the minimal or the basic minimum, and then now allow, allow private individuals to, to run things, then that would lead mass exploitation in my view from what we have seen thus far, even now when government still has some um, control over it. So I don't yeah. think the privatization or complete privatization, leaving people to their own devices is right for um, less developed countries. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There should be another rule to, to help to the people. But I agree, especially with Nasik in that, that point of view. Uh, that the aim is not uh, the growth or growth of the state, because it's easily for in, in, a, in any country, developed or not so well developed, it, uh, that the people who have the power try to have more and more and more and more power. This is not the aim of the state. This uh, the aim of the state is to empower the private people, and if you. Uh, put some rules and give them some, some equality, you have to stop and not to increase your power, but increase the power of the people. This is the aim. I, I think that is really deep, really deep in this idea. Well, we are on time. I think that uh, I have to stop. In any case, if, if you want to talk about more about these kind of things, you can email me or we can have another meeting outside of the lecture. But in this day, uh, well, it's, uh, we are on time. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see you next week.